you have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. And you can hang on to that. We'll look at it in just a moment. There are going to be different passages that we'll go through. If you're following them along with notes, you can write them down. Uh, if we've got them on screen, obviously, uh, in case I run a little too fast for you. Today I want to share with you couple of things. One thing that I love and one thing that I hate. We're concluding this series on multiply. Again, through our, it's not just limited to finances, but it has a direct implication to our finances, dealing with our time, our talents, our resources. And we want to see God multiply. Now, the one thing that I love, it doesn't take you long before you, you see it. I, I look at things differently. I recognize that. But one thing that I love is sharing and talking about generosity. Just throughout this whole month, how many have either learned something or you've just been, been challenged in some way through the Multiply series? I know that that's been that case in my life. And in this, I just love sharing about generosity because I recognized how that moved or worked in my life that was contrary to how I was naturally wired. And, and I love being able to, to see and sense what God is saying and doing and being, being able to walk through freely saying, God, I'm just a manager. I'm a steward of your stuff. I don't own anything. I'm just called to manage it. Now, that is what I love. What I hate is how often the way generosity is taught. Again, can I keep it real? I extremely despise how a lot of times it is taught on Christian television, especially when it comes to the topic this morning, sowing and reaping. You and I have heard it, we've experienced it, and in, in many places we're even gun shy when it comes to generosity, especially if it's coming from a preacher because we've been hurt by it, where we've been told, listen, plant your seed, plant your money, and then your miracle will come. That is a business arrangement with God that we turn around and want to manipulate him. You all, you all know it, right? You've turned on the television you weren't necessarily planning on watching, and you see the, the televangelist who's got, you know, the, the, the pink hair and the, the purple scarf, uh, and, and that's, that's just the preacher, not his wife. And you see the flashiness that's there. You see all of that. And, and if you're not careful, it, it will manipulate you. Where they turn around and say, send $1,000 on your credit card. Then God will get you out of, you know, debt. What? You know, unfortunately, it's not of God, okay? That kind of manipulation, God does not work via manipulation. But... Nonetheless, there are truths found within Scripture that deal specifically with sowing and reaping. That if we get through all the fluff, we get through all the man-centered ideas, and we seek what God is trying to tell us through it all, we find that it is applicable in our life. It's not just a nature thing, which you sow something, you'll reap it. So today, I want to be able to share with you with integrity, without manipulation, we're going to be concluding this series, Multiply, specifically talking about sowing and reaping. So let's just ask the Lord for wisdom. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you've prepared for us to hear right now. I pray that you dig through all the fluff that many of us have encountered. And I pray that in a foundational level, we get it. Lord, that it become real in our lives. God, I know what you've done in my life. I know the joy that is found when we recognize that it all belongs to you. Lord, that in it, you will use us, you will multiply, you will bless. But God, that is according to your plan, not ours. So speak to us in a special way through your word. In Jesus' sweet and almighty name we pray, amen. We have to be able to recognize the difference between keeping versus giving. Now, something I want you, if you just capture nothing else from this morning, this is what I want you to get. If you're taking notes, this is what I want you to get. This is a very clear thing with sowing and reaping and life in general. What you keep, what you keep is all you have. 
But what you give, God multiplies. What you keep, what you hold on to, what you stuff in and clench to, is all you're going to have. But what you give enables God to multiply. The principles of sowing and reaping. If you keep something, that's, that's all you're ever going to possess. If you hold on to it, chain it down, then guess what? It, it's not going to go anywhere. It may rot, but it's not going to go anywhere. But if you take what you have, and when God places in your heart, give, share, enable something. If you take it and you turn it into seed and you plant it so that it's used in good soil, God can bring something that multiplies. So I want you to say it with me, everybody together. What I keep keep is all I have. have. What I give, give, God multiplies. multiplies. One more time. What I keep keep is all I have. have. What I give, give, God multiplies. multiplies. Luke chapter 6, verse 38 says this. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. Now, that is a a direct sowing and reaping, uh, like an actual agrarian uh, farming system. And and I'm going to tell you real real briefly about it. Now, just so you understand context, what is so neat in Luke chapter 6, you actually see that Jesus pulls that in even in the midst of, he's not even necessarily talking about money. He's talking about treating others, judging others, working with them. So you see how this sowing and reaping thing bypasses even the limitations of finances. And he pulls that that very clear topic. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it will be poured into your lap. Jesus said that what you give, God will multiply. Now, there's a lot of people that turn around and say, okay, I understand that makes sense, but what is this whole pressed down, shaken together, running over thing? Well, when Jesus was on this earth, he was talking to a society that was driven, that was a lifestyle revolved, their income, the majority of people revolved around agriculture. They were agrarian in how they worked. So in this process, many people, when he shared that, immediately got it. They understood it. Even those who weren't making that living themselves, they were able to capture it because they know somebody who did. See, in those times, those who who had crops, they would turn around and hire day laborers. They'd hire seasonal people to come bring in the harvest. So imagine yourself, you're coming in the morning and you're going to be working all day. You've established what your wage is going to be. Well, with that, you would come in with these big baskets and you're going to have to carry it from the field to the barn or wherever it's going to be worked. So if you're going to be carrying a heavy load all day, are you going to stuff it to the point you can barely carry? You'll probably fill it halfway, three quarters, just enough for you to be able to transport it from the field into where it it, it needs to be. So that's how, you know, you would be working, just smart, trying to be, you know, efficient uh, yet effective. Now, This is how, in that day and age, the culture would would sometimes, at the very end, if you had a a generous landowner, the way many times he would either pay the day laborers or turn around and give an added bonus was this. After the full day's work or after the full week's work, he would then turn to the day laborers and say, okay, this last basketful, because of everything you've done, this last basketful is actually going to be yours. This is yours. Now, how do you think you would fill it? You would pack that baby down. You'd press it down. You'd shake it so that there'd be no air. How many people, yeah, I, listen, I, I love um, ices and, and smoothies. Anybody else have an affinity for that? Oh, man, it's a taste of heaven. Now, any of you, if you've ever gotten an icy or, or a slushy, when you go in, you know how you're going to get that cup, right? Experts in the place? You're going to put it in, and you're not going to fill it fully up yet, right? You're going to get to a point, you might actually take a little sip just to make sure the mixture's right. And then you're going to shake it up a bit, right? Because an icy is full of air. You're going to shake it up a bit, make sure it, it settles a bit, because, you know, it foams up. You know, you, 
you, and then you then get it to the point where you have the cone top so that it starts to pour over, right? It's not done till it begins to pour over. And then you've got, you know, <laughs> got to make sure it's all good, right? So you see, that is exactly, in essence, what Jesus is saying. On that last day, they would take their basket, they would press it down until it fill over. And Jesus was saying, that is how God gives to you when you give to others. What you keep is all you'll have. But what you give, God will multiply. Now, one of the reasons why that, that whole topic of sowing and reaping is, uh, has become, that teaching has become distorted very easily is because there's a common teaching, teaching, unfortunately, that is known as the prosperity gospel. Many of you have heard it, you've been around it. Uh, in essence, listen, I fully believe it is a wrong and distorted uh, message from the gospel. Where in essence, what it says is, you know, if you turn around and you give uh, and you live a particular lifestyle, then you better live a life, you're gonna have a life where you get to have abundant health, that you're never gonna be sick, that you're gonna turn around and drive a Rolls Royce. Every one of us, you're gonna have all these different things. So you do this because you're gonna get something. And the reality is those who preach it tend to have those nice things when none of us down here ever get to that point. So unfortunately, it, it is something that is, is a manipulative message, but that is not a true and biblical teaching, but it does not discount the truth that what you give, God does indeed multiply. There's also the flip side teaching that many of us have encountered. It's not the prosperity gospel, it is the poverty gospel, which turns around and says that if you have anything, if you own anything nice, then you are unrighteous. That's normally preached by those jealous of what you have that they lack. Where they turn around and say, you know, if you have anything, then, then you're unrighteous. That's wrong. Now, here's the truth. It's not what you have that makes you righteous or unrighteous. It is the condition of your heart about what you have. There's a lot of people who have a lot that, you know, they are just unrighteous. But there are also poor people who are unrighteous. So you have to be able to see that Scripture says that it is wrong to love money, but it does not say it's wrong to have money. Because Scripture actually goes on to say that God is the giver of wealth. He is the one who blesses. There is such a thing as, a, as the wealthy righteous who are faithful and generous and godly. And there is such a thing as unwealthy, a.k.a. the poor righteous just as there are the unrighteous rich and the unrighteous poor. The truth is, if you just live according to God's principles, you save all the money that you can, you invest it wisely in the ways that you can, and you give when you can. Scripture says that if you're faithful with a little, God will give you much. If you're a good steward, God will give you more seeds to sow and do the righteous thing. There are these different things that we're looking at. So what you keep is all you have, but when you give it to God, he will multiply. So what I want to do today is lay a foundation for sowing and reaping. So I want to lay, take a look at two principles. The first principle of sowing and reaping is this. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. I know it's elementary. I know. If you plant a seed in good ground, you're going to get a harvest from that seed. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. If you read it in context, Paul said that if you sow seeds of unrighteousness, if you do things that are, are wicked, those things that are, are not right, you're going to have a wicked response to what you do. You will reap what you sow. So help me on this. If you turn around and you plant uh, a seed, if you plant corn, you're not going to reap, you know, bananas, right? If you plant corn, you're going to get corn. If you plant apple seeds, you're going to get an apple tree. It's just a principle that translates in different areas. For, for example, if you smile at somebody, they are more than likely gonna smile back at you. Not all the time, but that just shows what kind of seeds they have. 
if you smile at somebody, even if they're not smiling, it may just cause, because you've just planted something that you can see grow back. If you offer forgiveness, people are most likely to forgive you. Husbands, if you treat your wife with love and respect, then she will more than likely treat you with love and respect. If you turn around and you give her a hard time, then she will multiply it and give you Hades. <laughs> Can I get an amen? So guys, many of you have just lived around the hard times. And that is what you've planted. And this is your saving message right now. Begin to plant good things, good words, good actions. Now, don't immediately turn around and expect it to grow overnight. Old habits die hard. Begin to plant good and uplift. You remember when we started the series, I talked about being generous in your words. Generous in your words, affirming to one another, not just in marriage, in your own relationships with your coworkers, in, with your neighbors. Listen, begin to plant something because what you plant is what you're going to reap. You reap what you sow. Second principle of sowing and reaping is you actually reap more than you sow. When you plant a seed in good ground, you will reap more than you sow. Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or, or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. If you lay down your life for Christ, you're actually going to receive far more than you have ever given. Jesus even talked about this principle a few chapters earlier in Matthew chapter 13. He, he actually told a, so, a story where he said, a sower went out to sow seeds, and he threw seeds out in different kinds of places, and different uh, areas began to, to sprout particular things. But once it hit good soil, it actually returned 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. You reap what you sow, and you actually reap more than you sow. John Snyder actually shared a story with me, and it was absolutely awesome. I don't know if you remember, uh, now it would have been probably right at three years ago, but Pastor Mead shared a story, and, uh, and he was talking about sowing and reaping. He actually had corn. Uh, you know, uh, was it kernel seed, basically, where he turned around and didn't, uh, Pastor Steve, weren't you the one involved? And they were just, anybody remember that, where he threw out seed? You know, the maintenance loved that, you know where they were just throwing out seed. And what John actually did is he took, you know, some of those kernels of, of some of those, uh, what do you call them, kernels? Okay, he took some of those kernels and he actually took it, I don't know if it was to his mother, but actually took it over and they planted it. And do you know, when he took just a small set of seeds, do you know he brought back a bag full of ears of corn? He brought it back just to make the point. What you sow is what you reap. And what you sow, you'll actually reap more. You reap more than you sow. You do indeed. Now, I want to unpack it a bit more, so we're going to spend the rest of our time in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll look at a few verses uh, through a very rich teaching that Paul laid out. And I want to show you three giving truths that I pray will totally transform your life as they have my own. The first truth, your heart matters when you give. Your heart matters when you give. The attitude of your heart matters when you give. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 6. goes on to say, 2 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 6, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly, or whoever sows little, will also reap sparingly. In other words, if you keep a lot and don't give much, don't expect a lot in return. You're unable to reap what you haven't sown. It goes on to say, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. If you plant a lot of seeds, you'll get a lot of harvest. Now, here's the key to me. He says, each man should give 
what he has decided in his heart to give, not what a preacher or somebody told him, but what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, not under manipulation. And then notice, for God loves a what? Cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. In fact, many of you know, the word in in the Greek that is translated cheerful can actually be translated hilarious. Hilarious. It's like for offering time, some people clap and you're going, oh, I love this because I get this. True giving isn't even about the money. It's about the attitude of your heart. See? We get caught up on all these different things. We get lost on so many different things. There was a story one time of a woman who was trying to teach her daughter the principles of of giving. So before church, she had a $5 bill and a $1 bill, and she gave it to her little girl, and she said, Here, sweetheart, here's $5, and here's a a $1 bill. I'm going to give them to you. One of them is for you, and the other is for God. So in offering time, I want you you to give. When the offering plate came by on Sunday, the mom just watched her little girl as she held the $5 and the $1 bill, and you could just see, you know, the whole thing working in her brain. And all of a sudden, she turned around and put the $5 bill back in her pocket and put that $1 down. You could see her wrestling with it. After church, the mom was just happy that, you know, the daughter, you could see, she at least did something. She could have kept both. But in that, she just pulled, you know, her daughter aside, and she goes, Honey, I'm so proud of you. I, I watched. You did a great job. But I, I am just curious. You know, tell me, why did you keep the $1, excuse me, keep the $5 bill? And why did you give just the one? She turned around and she said, Well, Mom, the, the pastor, the preacher actually said that God loves a cheerful giver. So I figured I'd be more cheerful with $5 in my pocket. <laughs> Now that's exactly how many of us have felt for so much of our lives. We have believed that we will be happier if we keep the most, keep more for ourselves. I learned something from my parents early, early on. Many of you know they're they're missionaries from the time they were 18 and single. They left to travel the world. They met in Ecuador, and they've done an incredible job, incredible job just giving their life. So they've, they've never had a whole lot of money in their lives. But do you know as missionaries that go around just as we have them uh, coming and they're, they're needing support, people that will buy into their vision and support and give. Do you know that my parents, even though that's what they do, they're dependent upon others to support them. Before they ever went on the field, they have supported other missionaries. They are dependent upon churches, people like you all, to support them. But they recognize they're not in it just to be able to fund their work account. They recognize if they're going to be blessed, then they are called to be a blessing. And it was so interesting to me because I'd see, you know, I I used to help dad as a teenager go through his financial records to keep things in order because the man needs all the help he can get when it comes to his receipts. That's why I'm so anal retentive about having things in order. It explains a lot to the staff, doesn't it? Yeah. So having things in order, I like it. So... With all these different things, I noticed that there was a certain amount going and, you know, I was used to money coming in and I just, it was interesting that, so I asked them, I said, is that some kind of tax, you know, that you're, you're required? They go, no. It was just a matter of fact, no. So then, then what is it? They said, hey, if people turn around and support us, we better be the first ones supporting. And it was so neat because it was just, that's life. There's no other option. And it marked me in such a way to recognize, listen, I'm blessed to be a blessing. Whether I'm a teenager flipping burgers at Mickey D's, or I'm somebody with a master's degree, or a PhD, or a business person, or whatever you do to make your living, that what you have, God lets you choose. You're going to keep it and hold on to it? Because he'll let you. 
but that's all you'll get. Or if you turn around and say, God, use this. Use it to plant seeds of righteousness in your kingdom. Then he will bless it. He will bless it. We need to strive to be fanatically good stewards. We need to be as you know, debt-free, only having that, that kind of debt like, like a home that can appreciate over time. We need to learn to live on less, to act our wage, as Dave Ramsey says. We also need to learn when God speaks to give extravagantly. When he speaks, well, that's just too painful. To, you know, to give extravagantly, that's just painful. Listen, you want to know how to change that attitude in your life? Just keep giving till it's fun. Just keep giving. Oh. You know, you keep doing that enough, you actually teach your body that it's not God, that it's not the one who has the decision, that God ultimately is in charge. Your heart will soon follow your actions. Soon you will love it. Second giving truth, you cannot outgive God. You can never outgive God. Moving on to verse 8, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. Note, this again is like the metaphor of, of the sower giving seed. He is giving gifts. And what seeds do you ha- have to give? You have your time, you have your talents, you have your heart, your words, your things, financial resources. He has given you seeds. Notice, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. What you keep is all you'll have. But what you give, God will multiply. When you sow generously, you're actually going to reap generously. And he will increase the store of your seed. You'll have more seed to give. And and here's, here's some of the things that he'll do. He'll begin to enlarge that harvest of righteousness. Now check it out. It is not necessarily that he's going to make you monetarily rich. See, that's where the prosperity gospel goes wrong. Just because you gave something, you think if you turn in a dollar, you better have the $100 check on the way. That's normally how it's taught to us. But listen, sometimes you do that, and God turns around and gives you favor in your workplace. Sometimes he gives you favor in your home. See, allow God to be the blesser. Don't force him to only bless you this way. Don't limit him. Don't close him off. He will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. And you will actually find yourself becoming more like him. You'll actually begin to take on his style of heart. You would rarely be more like God than when you give. Because God so loved the world, he he gave his one and only son. So we become more like Christ, more like God when we give. I shared a story about Pastor Robert Morris from Gateway Church down in in Texas. Extraordinary, extraordinary individual. He's he's the gentleman who I mentioned to you, he preached and they gave him the love offering and he automatically, God told him to give it to the missionary, not knowing what's going to happen. Well, I I was just sharing with a handful of people this past week where he turned around after that event, you know, in his prayer time, he all of a sudden felt God turn around and say, okay, you've got this trip to to Central America coming up, and I want you to sell your car, and I want you to hold on to the money. At that point, he's learned, okay, God, whatever you do. So he turned around and sold his car after, you know, once he got uh, what he sold it for, he actually had $12,000. How many know that's, that's not McDonald's money? So he had the money, and he said, okay, God, what, what new surprise did you have? 
goes down to Central America. The missionary there who picked him up had this rinky-dink old van. Yeah, I don't know if, if you've been overseas, but some cars just aren't in the best shape. And while they were moving, it was fine. But the floorboard had holes in it. So when they were stopped, all the exhaust would come and, you know, right through there and you're choking. You know, so that was the one time many people want the missionary to go fast. So as they were going, the conversation started... Uh, Robert turned around and just asked the missionary, he said, hey, when are you going to get a new van? <laughs> and the missionary said, actually, very soon. Robert's like, really? He said, yeah, God told me I'm going to get a new van this weekend. <laughs> Robert goes, okay, how much does it cost? $12,000. And Robert Morris knew before he would leave, he'd have this new van to give. So now he finds himself on the way home. He had to be picked up, <laughs> driven to the house. And in that moment where, where he just had utmost honesty with God, he turned around and said, okay, God, I finally did it. And God, you know, goes, you did what? I finally did it. I outgave you. I finally did it. He said, God, I, I'm not trying to challenge you or anything like that. He said, but I did it. See, you know, now I don't have a car. And I know you've enabled something over there. He said, that, that's pretty cool. And he said, God went, uh-huh. And he's, Robert Morris said, almost immediately, the phone rang. Went over, picked up the phone. The guy on the other line says, uh, is this Pastor Robert Morris? And Robert goes, yes. He goes, you don't know me. He said, but I'm a businessman. And God has impacted my life through many of your teachings said, I've seen you online, I've heard different things. And he said, I, I tried calling, but I knew you were, were overseas. Just wanted you to know that God spoke to my heart. And at the nearest airport nearest you, I have donated my corporate jet <laughs> for use in your ministry. He said, not only that, he said, I went ahead and I've already paid in full one year's salary worth of fuel and the pilot. And God went, uh-huh. <laughs> now listen, you can easily take that message and turn around and manipulate it a bit and say, okay, then God, I'd like a private jet. You know Robert Morris? He turned around and he sold that plane. After using it, he turned around and sold it. He drives everywhere, but he's given a few more cars since then. See, I shared that with somebody, and somebody very coyly, just jokingly said, okay, that's great, we get a plane, but how do I get to the plane? I don't have a car. <laughs> how many know that if God gave you a plane, he's going to take care of how you get there? Yeah. Ride a bike for all I care. <laughs> Here's the deal. You cannot outgive God. It's like compounding interest. But what I have compounding is God's love, his joy, his peace, his influence. Because we planted seeds and God increased the harvest of righteousness. You cannot outgive God. The third and final giving truth is this. People will thank God because of what you give. People will thank God because of what you give. Verse 11, you will be made rich in and what? Does it say you'll be made rich only financially? No way. Don't you dare limit the blessings of God just to wanting more money. It says you'll be made rich in every way. You'll be made rich in a good marriage, in good children, in generations to come. You'll be made rich in every way so that you can turn around and blow it on yourself and take life easy and sit back and be selfish, right? Did I mess that up? I did. You'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. People around the world will thank God because of your generosity. When you sow seed, God will give you more seed, and you can keep it. And if you do, that's all you'll have. But if you give it back, 
He will increase that harvest of righteousness. And people around the world will thank God on behalf of you. God will increase the harvest of righteousness. Now, here's the deal. And I want you to feel it and get it as a church. Every time we have service and somebody comes either at the altar, in their seat, in the hallways, wherever it is at. Every time someone, somebody's life is changed, it is because you have sowed seeds into good soil every time. And there are generations that will be different because you have chosen to be obedient and be faithful. Because you have sowed seeds. I mentioned John Snyder. He shared a story with us and the lay pastors about his father, John being the youngest of, of, of the children. His father was born in 1928 near Richmond, Indiana, right on a farm. His father was the youngest of seven kids and he could tell you firsthand the difficulty of living through the Great Depression. How, how difficult it was. They, they farmed with horses back then and labor was brutally hard. There was no combine to harvest the corn. And back then, you know, they didn't have nor could they use the, the special hybrid seed that would come. So what they did during harvest time, right after harvest, was they picked out the biggest and the best ear of corn to use as seed for the next year. The general rule was this. The biggest and the best seed produces the biggest and the best crop for the next season. Sure, they could have received a bit more money now if they had turned around and sold it. But then the harvest next year, in the long run, would be less if they planted with inferior seed. Give God your first and your best, and he will bless the rest. What you keep is all you'll have, but what you give, God will multiply. And see, this is where this message hits me, and I just want to be really honest with you. It would be very easy at this point in my life where I can turn around and take certain accolades. For the Assemblies of God, our fellowship, I am the youngest lead pastor in the state. I can turn around and put that as a badge of honor on my chest and walk around all chest puffed up. I'm the youngest lead pastor in the state. The issue is I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> so if that's where I pin my glory to, I'm in trouble. I can turn around and say, look, we're, we're a church that is on the move. We've got a mission, and it's exciting to see the growth and the momentum and decide to now put it in cruise control and just sit along. I'm just going to take life easy. Take it easy. Turn around, and I'm living in the harvest. But here's what I want you to know. Becca and I now have been here five years of our life, and I want you to know we're all in. We're all in. This is where God has called us to invest our lives. This is where God has called us to plant ourselves. This is where God has called us to plant. And we're all in. All that we have is invested here. And we're not doing it so that 10 years, 20 years from now, I can then take it easy. I have an eternal reward coming. I'll take it easy then. But in the meantime, I want to be involved. I want to be involved. And as a church and as a people, we're going to strive to be the most generous people on planet Earth because we cannot outgive God. When we give people in our community, in our backyard, through missions work around the world, every place that we're invested in, one day, you're going to find yourself in heaven and somebody's going to come up to you that you have never, ever had the pleasure or the opportunity to meet personally. And they're going to look at you and say, thank you. I am here because you planted. I am here. And it will come to life inside of you. What you have, you can keep. But that's all you're going to have. 
If you plan it, God will use it, and he'll multiply it. God, you've given us this. I will place you first. I'll go above and beyond. You multiply it. God, I ask that you would speak to all of us in a way that would transform us. That through it, Lord, it would enlarge the harvest of your righteousness in our lives. Let it not just be something to build somebody's ministry or somebody's image, God. All of that does not matter. What matters is, are you being shared? Is the light penetrating the darkness? Lord, I pray that you call all of us together. Now, in just a moment, not yet, but just a moment, ushers are going to come around. They're going to pass out a card. Listen, this card is between you and the Lord. How many people, like myself, you've, you've had the uh, give, give, give to the point where you've given and given and given five more, five more, five more, five more, where you had no five more? Well, here's the reality. Many of us have been burned through many of that. So when all of a sudden we've broken free, what is our reaction to go completely the opposite end and say, no, bare minimums for me? There can be a time where that is a time of healing. See, where it begins, this whole Multiply series, those of you who have not learned to give God your first and your best, where you bring your tithe, your 10%, that is where it starts. That is, that is just a, a, a minimum standard of living. That's where it begins. Where you place God first above everything else. And then you be, you're able to watch, okay, how can I start to work and get out of debt? How can I do all these things? By the way, one of the options on there is if you're interested in receiving classes that will teach those fundamentals, that's why we're here. We want to enable you to get to that point. So many of you might be a step of faith. Yes, I, I, I want to begin tithing, but I need, I need to learn to get things in balance. I, I need to live within my means, below my means, and get to that point. So you can mark that option. First option is that plain and simple. I want to begin to give. Giving God what belongs to him, bringing it back. Second option for those of us who have turned around and said, okay, God, I'm at that point. That, that's where I'm at. Maybe recognize in that moment, we're not law people, we're grace people. And grace always does more than the law. Now listen, I am not going to tell you what you need to do. For some of you, within your means, you recognize now's not a good time. But others, you might turn around and say, okay, I can at least do a dollar extra a week, five dollars more. For others of you, listen, I'm not going to tell you. It says, give what you've determined in your heart. Not under compulsion. In other words, don't let me manipulate you. I'm all in. What are you invested in? I'm ready because I believe in the mission of this church. So I want you to be able to ask, God, okay, what am I going to do? Where do I begin to build? So option number one, that is where it begins. God, I'm going to bring and give to you. Option number two, that Lord, as you've given, I want to see things multiply. So above and beyond. Now here's the thing. I don't like open-ended commitments that aren't connected within relationship and love. So in this particular thing, this is just saying for the next 12 months, as God enables. You think you can do that? For 12 months, God. I, I want to be invested in good seed. Again, listen to me. If you're not able to do it, peace be unto you. But listen to me. If you find yourself in service and God has a missionary here. And God says, you remember what you held on to? Now let it go. Do it. Do it. Give as if unto the Lord. But in the meantime, see, as a church, we find ourselves beginning to pick up steam. We are called to reach this community. But there are areas that we're not able to step into because we have not been able to have the seed to plant. Will you enable that seed to happen? Ushers are going to go ahead and pass out this card, just a multiply card. Again, this is between you and the Lord as far as what you want to do. Because it's a commitment card, you don't have to fill out an address unless you just want to. If you're a new tither and, you know, you want to, it's going to be the, 
you want the, the tax benefit from it, on the back you can write your address if you want. If many of you would much rather this be private and you don't want it to go out in front of everybody, you can put it in an envelope. I don't, it, it matters not to me. But what we've done is you choose option number one, that's where I begin. Begins with giving back to what, giving back to God what he's blessed me with. Option number two, for the next 12 months, I want to help elevate my church to the next level, above my normal giving. I want to give such amount, above and beyond my time, a week, bi-weekly or monthly, however you designate. And like I mentioned to you, we want to hear from you. If you want to be in a, a financial class makeover, total money makeover class, where we are able to enable a plan, practical plan, to get yourself out of the bondage of debt, let's do that. Then once you filled it out, you can sign it. The ushers are going to lay a basket. I'm going to pray for us. We'll be dismissed. I'll bless us. You can come. Drop it in the basket near you. Now listen, some of you realize maybe my spouse isn't here and I need to pray about it. I understand. If you didn't come ready, if God already has placed something, then, then obey. But if not, take it home. Bring it on Wednesday night as we conclude the spiritual gift series. Bring it next Sunday before we do our next level one-time offering. And let's see God take place. Many of you are filling this out, but can I pray for you as we fill this out? God, I do pray that you would bless your people in every way. God, we would never want to limit it to just finances, but I pray you'd bless them in health, with great relationship, with great children, and with generations of a spiritual legacy. God, I would pray that you speak, speak to your people right now. Right where you are, with your eyes closed, in your heart, you can ask God right now, just ask him, what have you given me that is seed? God, I can keep it. That's all I have, or I can plant it, and you can give it, and I know you'll multiply. God, I pray today that there would be those that you would speak to them about what to give this morning. Some, it might be an extravagant gift that they're planning on doing. You've laid in a special gift, maybe for next week. But Lord, even in this moment, more than just a one-time thing, for the next 12 months, saying we are committed to the mission and to the heart of this church. Father, you know I'm all in. And I pray that we all be in to see your work done. I pray that some will not even leave the building that are in without reaching out and blessing someone to close, that, are, that is close to them. God, I pray that they would see the gifts that you've given them as seed to sow into, into ministry, into real-life kingdom work by serving and using the very talents and time that you've given them. I pray that they would live in the season of harvest because they were faithful to sow the seeds you've given them. Go ahead and stand with me right where you are. If you fill this out, there's a tear-off portion. You can go ahead and rip that off. That is just for you, for you as a reminder. If you need it in your Bible, if you need it in your checkbook, wherever, it serves you best. I'm going to pray. I'm going to bless you. And you can come drop off your card, or if you need to, drop it off next week. Will you extend your hands this way and allow me to bless you? Heavenly Father, I pray now that you bless your children. Father, the reality is you have blessed us. All that we have belongs to you. Father, I now bless those who are stepping out in faith, who have never fully lived within the understanding that you need to be first in our finances, first in everything. And Lord, I pray that you challenge them to step out, to place you first, that their offering be acceptable before you. Father, and I pray that you enable, indeed, the very sowing and reaping principles within their life. Father, that as a people, we begin to recognize that it's not when man obligates, but when you speak, we must obey. Lord, for those of us feeling called to say, I'm all in. This is where I'm invested. This is where I'm called. Lord, I pray that we not miss what we give, but that you begin to enable it and bring a special blessing, that you take our church to another level, that we not go about, Lord, in the hole, in the red, and just barely getting by, but that you enable us to reach more lives. That one day we will find ourselves in heaven saying, Lord, what a blessing. Thank you for allowing us to be involved in other people's lives. Lord, right here in this place, 
in our neighborhood and around the world. Lord, I pray now that we will not hold on to things and cry mine, but that we will release it to you and that you will bless it. You will multiply it. That there'll be seeds of righteousness within this place. That we will be giving not just in resources, but in our talents and in our time. Use it now. Lord, may you be faithful as you've said you're faithful. And may we respond in like kind. I ask this now in Jesus' sweet and almighty name, the one who multiplies. Amen and amen. God bless and keep you all.